Welcome to Babelcom 5. This is episode 10 of season 5 of Babylon 5, A Tragedy of Telepaths. Presumably a collective noun? Before I begin, do not look at the screen after the episode title rolls because it will spoil the episode, trust me. You're okay just after 6 minutes in or so on the DVD version. Lockley recalls advice she was given not to do something because a friend asked you to. Now the telepath problem has proven the validity of that advice, as they've welded themselves into their area in Brown Sector. Unfortunately, aforementioned friend has problems of his own with the ISA under strain from the attacks on shipping. That's actually distracting the ambassadors from the telepaths knowing their secrets, combined with the expectation that they'll die when station security tries to remove them. However, they're assuming they will hold up together. They're not. Note Lockley gets real water to bathe with because she's command staff. Others tend not to. She notes that Londo and Jakar are still on Centauri Prime, although Londo seemed to be intending to leave ASAP last episode. She wonders if he might need a starship captain when he's Emperor, because she's not sure how her job is going. She may have a way to resolve the telepath problem, but she knows others won't like it, her friend included. She anticipates significant loss of life, but she's out of options. She ends her log and places a call to Psycor for the attention of Bester. Security are of course trying to burn through to Brown Sector, but every time they try they're met with freshly welded plate steel to slow them down further. Lockley doesn't understand how the telepaths can do that given how long it would take to put the new block in place, then gets a demonstration as the current cutter scrambles away from his work convinced by the crowd of telepaths on the other side that he's about to hit a bomb. Every time this happens, it gives the telepaths time to reinforce before another cutter can be brought in. Lockley observes that with no line of sight, it's going to need a lot of telepaths to get through to someone, and she presses her head to the cutting site as Byron and the others focus. She then makes up her mind to go in alone through a maintenance shaft, not something Zack and his teams can use, but it will get her in. Getting her out, will then be her problem over Zack's obvious objections. On Centauri Prime, Londo is puzzling over figures for ship production that suggest they are increasing their military budget by over 10%, when in peacetime they normally decrease it by 25%. Jakar suggests that the Centauri might be planning to invade themselves for once, and that once they're done, all the buildings could be ploughed under and the words too annoying to live grown in flowers big enough to be seen from space. Jakar then offers Londo some fresh spoo, which he is not impressed by because Centauri only eats spoo that has matured to its correct taste. Jakar notes he grabbed it from a tray going to the south end of the palace. Then realisation dawns when Londo says only Narn can stomach fresh spoo. He demands to know what's in the south end of the palace, and Londo pauses as he considers, giving a list that finally concludes with underground cells. Jakar, grim-faced, demands to be taken to them immediately. The cell is not empty as Londo had supposed. Instead, we find it is occupied by Natoth, Jakar's old aide, who we have not heard of since the invasion of Narn by the Centauri. Jakar embraces her, then they catch up on Narn's freedom and membership of the ISA, he telling her that she was presumed dead after the orbital bombardment of Narn, which she now recounts, when it felt like the universe had turned on them and put a second star in the sky. She awoke in the ruins of the capital with a Centauri boot on her neck. She tried to bite it. That was the last thing she remembered until waking up on the ship bringing her to Centauri Prime as a trophy from the war. When she was not sufficiently entertaining in the royal court, she was placed in this cell, and two years later here she remains to Jakar's outrage. Londo suggests she was simply forgotten, he had no idea she was here. This of course enrages Jakar further, but Londo explains that if the Emperor gave the order and then failed to countermand it, it stood, even with the cessation of hostilities. He recounts a tale where in his younger days, a guard stood in a courtyard day after day, seemingly guarding nothing at all. Even the Emperor of the day didn't know what he was doing there. Apparently, some 200 years earlier, a princess had ordered a guard to watch over the first spring flower at that spot, and then forgot to countermand the order, so the guard remains long after flower and princess have passed. These things happen in a monarchy, it seems. 
Jakar assures him in no uncertain terms that this is a mistake that is going to be corrected, and if Londo as Prime Minister can't override the Emperor and the Regent won't help, then Jakar will burn the parts to the ground in order to leave with her. On the station, Zack has found Lockley her way in. It's exactly what he said it would be, cramped and potentially with retracing her steps crawling backwards the only exit. She declines his offer of the PPG, but grabs a flashlight from a technician, telling Zack help is a day or so out and the details are on her desk. She starts making her way in. Sheridan has heard the news and Garibaldi is actually quite impressed, but they aren't the telepaths he's worried about. It's the ones who aren't in a cell of their own making that he's concerned about, because sabotage is a distinct possibility. Just to add to their fun, a Drazi patrol has brought in Brookiri metal from an attack area, which Sheridan fairly surmises is going to cause a flashpoint in the council, even if it's a long way from proof of anything. Sheridan wonders if it ever gets easier, and why it feels like everyone is pulling at threads to pull the ISA apart. Garibaldi's response is that we tend to measure time periods not by peace, but by conflicts. We get a perverse pleasure in seeing things fall apart. The bigger, the better. Right now, the ISA is in danger of becoming such a thing. Lockley arrives at her destination, and as she has been led to believe, no malice is meant towards her. She updates Byron and the others on the attacks on shipping and increasing paranoia to the point where their timing has utterly misfired and doomed any hopes they might have had of getting a homeworld. Nevertheless, neither Byron nor his faithful intend to walk out or indeed give up the identity to those who left before they sealed themselves in. He does, however, wish to thank Lockley, if not for being in favour of them, then for at least for being fair to them, and he shakes her hand whilst acknowledging that this is likely to be the last time they speak. Having tried, Lockley takes her leave of them. On Centauri Prime, Jakar has arranged for a Narn ship to meet them on the way back to Babylon 5 to take Natoff home, but Londo still needs a way to get her out of her cell and the palace without killing any guards or otherwise attracting undue attention. At that moment, a slender Centauri aide enters to advise that the next line into Babylon 5 is leaving that evening. Before she leaves, Londo clearly has a light bulb moment and asks her for her clothes. Later, only she divests herself of them right there and then in front of Jakar, to Londo's surprise. She says she played this game with Cartagia, but she doesn't think Londo is her size. That, of course, is an issue for Londo. In a closed council session, the Drazi accuses Bukiri, saying they will engage in reprisals, but then the game introduces evidence of Drazi attacks on their shipping. The Drazi ambassador says it's a trick, and Sheridan agrees, but it's not the trick the, dra the, tri the, the Drazi ambassador thinks it is. He's had Garibaldi look at the fragments, and they're too smooth to have been blown off a ship. They were cleanly cut, then planted where they'd be found to give the impression that another race was involved. A classic case of divide and conquer. Delenn urges the ambassadors to give them more time to determine the real truth of the matter. Londo has a plan. On entering a toth cell, he tells the guard not to return to it, to stop her food and water, and wall up the passageway so her remains will not be found. As he starts to free her, she says she will kill him, but he tells her she'll have to get in line. Then Jakar joins them to provide reassurance to her. At the station, several furies dock up and Lockley greets Bester. She of course gets an I told you so from him, but he is confident that it will all be alright now he's here. It is of course Natoth rather than Londo who dons the dress of the aide, with a veil over her head and a liberal sprinkling of what is likely bravari for all. Jakar is confident of her ability to warp to the landing area, but Natoth does not understand how they will make it, to which Londo explains the royal court has been trained not to see that which is inappropriate. So he proceeds to lurch drunkenly through the royal court with her, drawing all yet none of the attention of the court by being far too loud and far too obvious about his carnal intentions for the woman he is escorting through them. Jakar hangs behind, not quite believing they're making it work. One of the free roaming telepaths is interrupted mid-graffiti to be told that Bester has been seen coming on board. Whilst he acknowledges that this isn't what Byron wanted, none of them want to return to the core, and so he decides they need to arm up and fight back for Byron's sake, given he can currently do nothing to help. 
Vesta rapidly convinces the cutter that there is no, in fact no bomb about to go off in his face, and then uses him as a bridge to the ground grouped telepaths on the other side, blocking any further attempts to distort his perceptions while he works. The three telepaths are also occupied, taking a security member hostage in order to extract armory codes and a handprint from him. The renewed attempt to cut through the ground sector then comes under fire, just as Lockley was agreeing that Vesta could take the rogues back with him this time. Both sides suffer casualties, but Bester is entirely unconcerned about the normals' fatalities to Zack's disgust, although the cutter is amongst them, so the attempts to get through to the telepaths will presumably have to wait again. The telepaths in seclusion are inevitably in poor spirits, as they have some idea of what is going on. Baron is not prepared to have killing happening in his name, even if he is not directly involved, so he is resolved to take action, although what that will be is unclear. Sheridan and Delenn have called the game, Drazi and Brakiri ambassadors back to discuss their positions again. There is now a fleet of Drazi Sunhawks po poised to retaliate against the Brakiri, but as Sheridan shifts the view, the Drazi ambassador sees that there are white stars poised to strike the Sunhawks if they attack the Brakiri. Sheridan reminds them that this is in fact exactly what they signed up to in joining the Alliance, whether they realise it or not. If you act alone, you stand alone and either face, face the repercussions or leave the Alliance. Act together and the White Star Fleet will support you. Sheridan doesn't want to see it all fall apart given the lack of solid evidence currently available. So again, he and Delenn ask for more time. The Drazi Ambassador is prepared to give them some, but notes that in threatening their forces they have made a mistake, and every great fall starts with one. In interstellar space, Natoth's transfer goes off without a hitch, Londo admitting he found it exhilarating to get her out. But now he's starving. Jakar believes Natoth will be fine physically, but it may take her spirit longer to recover from reincarceration. Jakar quietly wishes her goodbye as he watches her jump out. We finally return to the station as an Earth transport docks up and disgorges Psycor Bloodhound units and Psychops, Vesta's reinforcements. Lockley tries to get some sleep, but she knows all too well that the next day the killing will begin. This episode really works hard off the back of the previous one, although having literally watched the previous one yesterday, there's suddenly a lack of urgency in Londo's departure, and he has access to the ship information the Regent seemed keen for him not to see. I may have missed something in that last episode, or perhaps Londo simply changed his mind and decided he needed to do at least some research before leaving, before then getting sidetracked by the seemingly random spoo incident. Clearly, one should never underestimate the importance of Spoo. Now, obviously, the Spoo leads us to a completely unanticipated reintroduction to a very old character, even older than you might think, in fact, because she's played by her original actress here. Yet, as I recall, and I may be wrong here, but because she has a speaking part, JMS was obliged to credit her at the front of the show rather than the back. So if you happen to be fairly awake as the main segment starts rolling, you actually get spoiled for this development, which is as has had absolutely zero foreshadowing to that point. To be honest, I really can't recall if it got me first time round, or if I was pre-warned by the UK news group. I was just telling someone about before coming back to writing this. I have no idea if this is still a rule, because TV is structurally very different these days of course but it's just so bizarre for a show to have to spoil itself inside an episode like this. In any event this is another great example of this season suddenly pulling someone from a much earlier season back into the fold and here Natoth as downtrodden as she is clearly still has some of her kick-ass spirit intact. It's also a moment where Jakar almost reverts to his season one state and the way in which he makes it deeply clear to Londo that Natoth will be getting released. It seems that Londo's workaround is simply not to order her released, but rather cocooned, so it doesn't really go against any standing orders, because so far as the guard knows, she'll be exactly where she's supposed to be, forever. It's still a bit of a risk for the guard, I suspect, but arguably a greater one for Londo. In light of the flashback to the Long Twilight Struggle, which is episode 20 of season 2, as Natoth retells the events leading to her incarceration, it was clever to then use the same type of ship window for Jakar to look at Natoth's ship leaving as Londo looked at the decimation of Narn from. I think in the episode, Jakar suggests it's been two years since she's been seen, but it's probably nearer three at this point, especially as we didn't see her for most of season two before then, owing to the change in actress then not really working out. 
So whilst this segment is unexpected, it perhaps closes the book on a character in a way we wouldn't have seen had season five not happened. And it's an interesting commentary, both on the way in which Centauri society operates and the extent to which Londo is prepared to go to bat for Jakar under the noses of the royal court. Back on the station, Byron's plan continues to unravel as the free telepaths take up arms against station personnel. You might argue that was triggered by Bester's arrival, and you might well be right, but Sheridan had effectively given Lockley the green light to take the gloves off, so an escalation was inevitable. And credit where credit's due, Lockley puts in the personal effort to try and find a resolution, just like the previous station commanders would have done. Byron just isn't open to persuasion, unfortunately. Those who remained with him are clearly going to be his strongest backers, yet ironically, he knows that his overall approach is doomed at this point. The violence in his name is the worst possible outcome for him, personally. Finally, we have the ongoing attacks on ISA shipping, which are increasingly looking like frame-up jobs intended just to disrupt the ISA. Unfortunately, they're achieving their aim given the lingering distrust between the races. It was one thing to form the ISA, it's clearly going to be another to keep it knitted together in earnest, even though we have heard of examples of races working to support one another. It's a curious thing to see Delenn and Sheridan in relatively minor roles in these episodes because they're now less hands-on than they once were. You can't really have a president jumping into a star fury every episode. It's a shift in focus and also almost odd to have both Sheridan and Garibaldi out of any semblance of a uniform too. Zack seems pretty settled as head of security, however, and Lockley seems to be a touch more settled than she was originally, even if Sheridan is handing her some pretty awful situations to have to deal with. I've barely mentioned Vesta, of course, but then he's not a huge part of this episode for once, but he'll be in the next two. I did think it was ironic that he was worried about inflation more than bodies on a deck in the current climate. The more things change, the more they stay the same, and all that good stuff. He does get some of the best lines, and any newcomers unfamiliar with him are reminded of just how little he values normals, whilst identifying the rogue telepaths as family, even if they're somewhat misguided from his point of view right now. And I suppose somewhat ironically, we end the episode with Lockley adopting an old Ivanova mantra of boom tomorrow. I too will also end here, very nearly halfway through the final season of the show now somehow, not quite sure how that's happened, but I guess the nights are drawing in on 2022 now, and I did aim to finish this project by the end of the year. Catch you next time.